Greetings again today in that name that's far above every name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the auditorium in the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We appreciate our visitors. You're always welcome here at Northside. And it's a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord. And we do want to glorify Him this day. And to you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. And you out there listening, if you have a friend to shut in, they don't know about this broadcast, get on the phone and call them and tell them to tune in and get this hour coming up and we can be a blessing to them, I'm sure. Now the message and the tape, message and the, the singing will be on cassette tape. I'm bringing a message on this line of thought, Labor Day for God's people. Tomorrow is Labor Day and we're going to bring a message on Labor Day for God's people. This will be tape number 194. Miss Brother Gibson, Brother Howard Gibson slept with his shoes off the other night and took a terrible cold, disabled to be here. No, I'm just kidding about his shoes, but he did take a cold, took it from his wife. What do you think about a good woman give a husband a cold like that? Well, maybe he'll soon be over with it and back with us again. I told him on the phone, I hardly recognized his voice. But maybe he'll soon be well and back with us again. We miss Brother Howard when he's not here. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and John chapter 9. And by the way, today we're starting a brand new year in our radio ministry. Year number 38. We've been on the radio daily here in Athens, Georgia for 37 complete years. We started on the first day of September in 1948. God's kept us on the air for 37 complete years. And we're going into year number 38 today, and I thank God for the privilege. Many people in heaven, preachers preaching the gospel, churches been established, missionaries on the field, and multitudes have been comforted and helped in their last days on the earth because of this radio ministry. And we give God the glory, the praise, and the honor. We don't deserve any ourselves. We give it to the Lord. He rightly deserves that. It's His work, His business. It's a home mission work, and I thank God for his children that he's spoken to and raised up during the past 37 years to keep us on the air week after week. We pay our radio bill every Monday morning. I refuse to go in debt to the radio station. Before I do that, I'd borrow the money or take it out of my own, which I have done sometimes, take some of my own, and uh, pay the radio bill. I will not go in debt to the radio station. We pay our bill every Monday morning by the week. We don't pay it by the month, we pay it by the week. And so I thank God for these 37 years. We have paid for the gospel, God's people, more than $250,000, I suppose. And it's invested in a great cause. And God has used it and his treasure laid up in heaven. And we thank God for the privilege, the open door. Now, yesterday, there's a dear man, he's in such condition, he could hardly speak above a whisper. He started to tell me to have some of the singers to sing how great they are, and his breath is short, he just couldn't, he had to pause, and tears began to trickle down his cheeks, and finally, in a whisper, he said, have some of your people to sing how great thou art. And so they did that this morning for Brother uh, Speedy Benham, uh, that... Uh, I was in his presence on yesterday. He listens to this broadcast. And so we're always glad that we can be a blessing to people. Right in to get the tape. And then we have a wonderful trip planned for the Holy Land in March. We're going to Israel and Rome. We're going to Mount Hermon, the highest mountain in Israel. And uh, many wonderful places. Mount Calvary, Garden Tomb. See David's tomb right on the Sea of Galilee. Going to Rome, going to Paul's prison. Go in the Vatican and various places there. And it's a wonderful, wonderful trip and a reasonable price, a 10-day trip. Right now is the time to get your name on the list because there's certain things you have to get done before you can go. And if you'd like to have a brochure on a Holy Land tour, write in and request it. If you'd like to have a list of our cassette tape, we'll send you a list of 192 of our cassette tape. 
Just request them. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603, is the zip code number. We'd like to hear from you. We do covet your prayers, and we'd like to hear from you next week. Turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. I'll read there and then read another verse. And this is found on page 1228. Page 1228. The last verse in 1 Corinthians 15. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know. Here, listen to what Jesus had to say in John chapter 9. Jesus said in John chapter 9 and verse 4, he said these words. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. The night cometh when no man can work. Time is fleeing by and you need to get all the time you can as it flees by and use it to the glory of God. Much in prayer, much in activity for God. I reminded the little boy who was sitting with his family in the living room. It's about bedtime and he started up the stair steps and he paused and he turned back to his family. He said, I'm going upstairs to say my prayer. I said, uh, anything any of you want? Well, he had great faith enough to believe that if he went up there and told God what they wanted, that they could get the answer. That's childlike faith. And so we need to look to God in faith and service as we move toward the end. God placed men on the earth to labor. The curse of do nothing is very, very harmful. When I was a little boy growing up, I had to work. I had to work every day. We're living in a day now when many times parents will go out and mow the lawn rather than their uh, teenage boy having to do it. They don't want him out there mowing the lawn. They'd go do it themselves and do chores around the house that the boys could be doing or the girls. I know mothers that wash the dishes. They'll sweep the floor. They'll make the beds. They'll clean the house and let their teenage daughters sit around and look at TV and they just do it themselves rather than to call on their children. I don't know why they do that unless they feel sorry for their children having to work a little. One of the greatest things that your children could do, one of the greatest thing is to work. Let them do some work. Now work won't hurt anybody. All children ought to do some work. There need to be some chores that needs to be done around the house. Some errands that need to be run and, and instead of you parents running your feet off waiting on the children and doing the chores and doing the work. Give them a job. Let each one have a job to do. Back when I was a little boy, it was my job to get the water in. We had running water in our home. And the running water was that I had to go to the spring about a quarter of a mile away and grab a bucket of water and run back. Now that's the kind of running water we had. We had ice water in the winter time. And uh, we had many chores to do. We had to build the fires and in the fireplace, get in the kindling to start the fire. Now, when I got married and we had, my wife and I bought a little coal stove where you burn coal in there. Now, I never did like to see my wife start a fire in the morning when it was real cold and so I always cover up my head. But when I was a little boy, I, I had to start that. I'd get the kindling and have to go in and start the fire. And the people would get up and they would uh, go to the fireplace and burn on one side and freeze on the other. And then they would turn around and, and burn the other side and freeze the other side. Now that's the way it was in those days. Of course, we had garbage disposals in those days in our house. Had cracks you could stick your finger through and we just swept the garbage down through those cracks and the chickens got it on the house. That was a, a garbage disposal of that day. We had those things. We didn't have any wall-to-wall -wall carpet. In fact, a lot of times didn't have any wall-to-wall -wall floor. Uh, but it was rough in those days and we were poor. We were so poor until the poor people called us poor. And so we would work hard and get in from school and take our overalls off the clean ones and put on the dirty ones and work until nightfall and milk the cows and feed the pigs and 
things of that type. We had chores. We had to work. And I appreciate that. I really do. This young generation, they don't know anything about work. And I tell you, it, because of that, it's harmful to them. They're missing out on something great. They're missing out on the work they ought to be doing. That's God's divine plan for people to work. And you parents that do all the chores and do the work and let your children sit around and look at TV or listen to radio or, or sit around with another group of young people and talk and laugh while you're doing the work. You are doing them an injustice. You're doing yourself an injustice. It'll be good for your children to have work to do. There's many of a young person today that's gotten into trouble because they had nothing to do. And the curse of nothing to do today is one of the greatest curses that's befallen our young people today. Not only our youth, but you've got people today that's living on welfare that's absolutely too sorry to work. Now, if you'd quit giving them what they get on welfare, they'd go out and go to work and make a living, but as long as they can have it handed out, they're not going to work. They wouldn't have a job sampling pie in a, fire, a pie factory. They're just not going to work. There are some people not going to work. And in many families, the more illegitimate children they can have in that family, the bigger the welfare check. And so they know that and they plan it in that direction. And that's not right. God said man should work and earn his daily bread. If he doesn't do that, the Bible says a man that don't work, he shouldn't eat. Let him starve to death. If, he, if he's able to work and he won't work, just let him starve to death. Don't feel sorry for him. Beloved, a man that won't work shouldn't eat. And the Bible said a man that won't provide for his household is worse than an infidel. A man that marries a beautiful young girl and she births his children into the world and he's so sorry that he won't work. Beloved, the Bible says that man is worse than an infidel. I feel sorry for any woman that has a sorry, lazy, no good husband that'll hang around the pool room and the juke joints and his poor wife trying to work and feed the family. I feel sorry for a woman that has that kind of man that she calls her husband. He's not much of a man, he's not much of a husband. Now there may be a time whenever the husband is disabled to work and a good woman would be willing to do what she could to help take care of the family in that respect. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about lazy, no good people. That's too lazy to work when God plainly said in this Bible that we're to work on this earth. That's God's divine plan. I was down in the city of Milledgeville, Georgia many years ago. I went down there with a man to see about getting his brother out of the institution down there. And we were sitting there in the courtroom and a lawyer came in with a young man. He was a black man, but could just as well have been a white as far as what happened. And, but he stood there before the judge, and, and the lawyer said to the judge, said, Your Honor, sir, said, this man has a wife and six children. And said he just won't work. He won't work. And said the welfare has to keep up his family. And said, what do you think ought to be done with a man like this? The judge said to that lawyer, he said, now what do you think ought to be done to him? That lawyer said, Your Honor, sir, if the welfare is going to keep up his wife and family, put him out there in the chain gang and let him work for the county, uh, put him in the stockade, let him work for the city. If we've got to keep up his family, then let him work for the city. I said, Amen. I wasn't in the church, but I gave a good heart, Amen. I believe that. If the welfare has to keep up a man's family and he's so sorry, and no good that he won't work, ought to put him in a stockade and let him work for the city while the city keeps up his family. Now, if you believe that, say amen. amen. All right, you know I'm telling you the truth. We're in a terrible mess here in this nation, and many times I'm afraid a lot of this welfare stuff has absolutely done us more harm than it's done us good. It created people that's absolutely not going to work as long as they can get a handout. And many of them are not going to work as long as they can steal and rob and kill. And they're not going to work. And God plainly said work. Now tomorrow is Labor Day. Now a lot of people don't like that word labor. But tomorrow is Labor Day. Jesus said labor for him. He said the labor is a few. In Matthew chapter 9 verses 37 and 38. Then said he unto the disciples. 
The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that it send for the labors into the harvest. God wants labors in his harvest, in his vineyard. The vineyard, the world is the vineyard out here. And God wants people that's willing to work for him. There's not too much work taking place in many of our churches today in a biblical sense. A lot of people run their heads off in little entertainment programs and shindigs. Now I'm talking about real working for God. I mean real old-fashioned praying and, and Bible reading and witnessing and trying to win people to God and spending time on our knees. Not too much of it today. And Jesus here is talking about soul winning. He said that there's no laborers out there. There's only a few of them out there. And pray for laborers. The fields are white under harvest. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus sent them out two by two and said, You go into the villages and tell them about the Savior. Tell them about God. And he sent them out working for him. Now, don't let the enemy stop you from your labor. In Nehemiah chapter 4, we find that Nehemiah, greatly burdened uh, for the walls in Jerusalem, and the temple and he he got permission from the king in Babylon to go back and rebuild the walls and when he went back old Sanballat and Tobiah and others that hated the Jews they came around and made fun of him they said man if, if a fox crossed over that wall he'd break it down what are you trying to do you better come down and talk with us about this matter he said I'm here to build a wall and I'm not coming down. In Nehemiah 4, 1, but it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we build the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. But in verse 6, he said, So built we the wall, and all the walls were joined together under half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. Nehemiah said, We're going to build these walls. We're not going to let the devil stop us. These people have a mind to work. They're not afraid to work, and we're going to build these walls. And they got busy and built the walls. And old Toby Iron and the sand ballot could do nothing about it. And when you decide to work for God Almighty, the devil can't stop you if you determine to work for God. Work while it's yet day the night cometh when no man can work. The Bible says be always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What you do for God's not in vain. The old Philistines back in the days of Isaac and Abraham and Jacob, Isaac was a well digger. And to dig a well was something that was very important and essential in those days. And if you could dig a well, it wouldn't be long until you'd have a village around that well because everybody used the well. Water was a scarcity in those days. But they had dig these wells and those old Philistines, the enemies of God would come in and fill those wells up and then they'd go back and dig them out again. They'd slip in and fill them up and, and uh, the Israelites would go back and dig them up and dig them out again. Beloved, when the devil tries to fill up your well to hinder you in what you're doing for God, then dig her out again. If he comes back and tries to fill it up, he'd dig it back out again and keep some good sparkling water coming out of the well to the glory of God. But did you know while you're laboring that you will receive your extra blessings from God. God is not going to give a lazy individual anything extra. God's going to bless those that went into work. I remind the old man sitting on the tree, he hadn't had a bath in months and months, and head is dirty, and, and he's sitting under the tree, and old uh, flies got all over his head, and he is too sorry and lazy to knock the flies off his head. After a while, an old yellow jacket lit right up on top of his head and really popped him right in the top of the head. He just reached up and said, Now, uh, just for that, every last one of you can get off. There's always a smart aleck in every crowd. Well, now, sometimes it might take a smart aleck to get you to do something, but do something for God. Amen? That's what we need to do. Labor for the Lord. And while you're laboring for God, that's when you get your greatest blessings. When you're doing something for the Lord, that's when you, you're most happy because you're doing it for the Lord. In the book of Ruth, chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and report you not, and let fall also of handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them, that she may glean them, and rebuke her not. 
Now here we find a beautiful Moabitess woman by the name of Ruth gleaning in a field of Boaz, an Israelite, there in Bethlehem. And he went out to that field and he spotted that beautiful girl. She had gone out to gather a little grain for her and her mother-in-law, Naomi. And she was there working among the workers. Now the, the Bible law in the Old Testament said that uh, don't take all the grain. Leave some around the edges and let some drop around on the ground for the widows and the poor and those in need. And she was out there picking up a few grains of wheat that had fallen on the ground. Boaz came out, the man that owned the field, the man that owned the labors, and the man that was very wealthy, he spotted that beautiful woman. No doubt he said to some of those fellows, said, hey, he said, who is that lady over there? Oh, they said, don't you know, sir? He said, that's uh, Ruth, the Moabites, that came back from Moab with Naomi here some time ago. And he stood there, no doubt, and shook his head and said, well, I'll tell you, she's a beauty. She's certainly a doll. He, he just fell for her immediately. And then you know what he said? Uh, she was gleaning out there in the field, picking up the grain and, and putting it in a, a carriage, whatever she had to carry it back home in. And he said to his workers, he said, fellas, I want you to do a little something extra here. He said, while you're cutting this grain, I want you to let some handfuls on purpose fall on the ground and leave them there. Leave some handfuls on purpose so she can pick them up and get all the grain she needs. Now while she was busy in the field, picking up what little she could, then she received the handfuls on purpose. It's while you're doing your best for God, serving Him, picking up the fallen grain, that God's going to dump you out some handfuls on purpose. Now if you'll be faithful and serve God, you'll get that handful on purpose, and God may give you a handful on purpose, before next week. Have you ever received something that you didn't expect to receive? Something came your way that you hadn't thought about it coming your way, a little something extra, something that was a real help to you, something that maybe you wanted but you didn't think it's going to get? Well, maybe that's a handful on purpose that God dropped out for you along the way. If you'll be faithful in serving God and what you can do, God will see to it that some handfuls on purpose be dropped out for you along the way. The Bible says in John chapter 6 and verse 27, Labor not for the meat which perish, but that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. So he said, labor for that meat that lives forever, that uh, everlasting life. You must labor for Him, for God. You don't labor to earn everlasting life. You labor for God because you are saved and want to serve the Lord. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 12, the sleep of a laboring man is sweet, but eats little or much. Now, you've heard people talk about going to bed on a full stomach or not eating anything or eating too much. The Bible said a laboring man, a man that goes out here and really works, I mean, he really sweats. He gets out here and he slings the, the hammer, the shovel, the axe of the mattock or whatever he's using or wherever he's laboring and he puts in a good hard day's work well he'd eat all he wants to and go to sleep in the general room he can he can just eat he don't have to worry about not going to sleep he can sit down and eat and go to bed and and sleep like a log all night long because he's a laboring man he doesn't have a lot of things on his mind he just worked hard all day and he's not going to take his job to bed with him and so he goes to bed and goes to sleep in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 18, he says, For the scripture says, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. The labor is worthy of his reward. God doesn't want anybody to do anything for nothing. God's been good to us. He saved us by his grace. Now listen, let me say something here. I want you to get it. God saved you by his marvelous grace. That's a gift from God. That salvation that didn't cost you one penny. God saves you by His grace. After you are saved, it is God that worketh in you to will and do of His good pleasure. It is God that worketh through you. It is God that does the job through you. And when you come to the judgment seat of Christ, God's going to reward you for having worked through you while you were here upon the earth. God is not going to be indebted to any man. God is going to see the labor is worthy of his high 
and his payday comes. God will see to that. So anything you do for the Lord is not in vain. Don't murmur. Don't complain. Don't worry. And don't get aggravated about things you do for God. That's the greatest work you've ever done in your life. That's the greatest thing you could ever do. All these other things are going to pass away. When you come to the end of life's journey, and it's about time for you to step over, all things done in the image of the flesh and for yourself will pass away. The only thing that's going with you when you go on the judgment seat of Christ are the things that you have done for God. Now you must remember that what you have given, what you have done, what you have sacrificed, what you have suffered, all of these things on the record goes to the Bemar seat of Christ. Now Jesus knows our works. We don't fool God. If you read the seven churches there in Asia Minor in Revelations chapters 2 and 3, in every last one of them he said, I know your works. I know your works. I know your works. God was concerned about their works. Now, if God's concerned about those works and their representative churches, they represent the church age from the beginning at Pentecost to the rapture. And if God was concerned about all their works, He's concerned about our works. He surely is. He's concerned about what we do for Him. And God requires us to be faithful in what we can do. The Bible said about a certain woman in the Bible, she did what she could. That's all that God expects out of you. God doesn't expect out of you that you cannot do, but what you can do. And there's something that every child of God can do. There's something you can do. And you do it to the glory of God. And then, of course, uh, we should be adding to our efforts, abounding in the work of the Lord. He tells us we labor this together for the Lord because the time is running out. Now, Jesus said in Matthew 25, there he condemned or uh, spoke uh, uh, I think in a negative viewpoint pertaining to a slowful worker. A lazy, slowful, drag around, hit or miss kind of individual. Now the Bible says he's not going to get any reward for the judgment seat of Christ. Just a mediocre, just a don't care if it happens all right, if it don't, all right. No, no. God is not going to reward that kind of, if you want to call it work. He's not going to do it. He spoke about the slowful servant, and in Romans chapter 12, verse 11, he said, Be not slowful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Be not slowful in business, fervent in the spirit, serving the Lord. Now, just don't drag around like lice falling off a dead dog. Beloved, listen to me. Be fervent in the spirit, serving God. Appreciate the fact of what you're doing and the opportunity you have to serve God. Just don't hit or miss. Because you've got to face these things at the end of life's journey. And we'll be, we'll, we'll be according to our works, uh, be rewarded, the Bible tells us. When we come to the judgment seat of Christ, and I'm going to give you the scripture references, and I'll not read the scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13. Now we need to realize there's time coming when we're coming to the judgment seat of Christ. Now when we come to the judgment seat of Christ, there's one thing that God is concerned about, and that's our works, the kind of works, the, the amount of work we've done. And it's our works that's going to be judged there. From the judgment seat of Christ, no man goes to hell. From the judgment bar of God, no man goes to heaven. At the judgment seat of Christ, God is going to judge your works. He's not going to judge whether you're saved or lost. He's not going to judge your past sins at the judgment seat of Christ. All that was taken care of on Calvary by Jesus. When you come to the judgment seat of Christ, God is not going to write out all the sins you committed from the time you were saved until you came then. Going to point, no, no, that's not what it's all about. The judgment seat of Christ is to judge your works to determine your reward, and that's all. That's it. The blood of Jesus Christ takes care of your sins. He cleanses you from all your sin. And when you die and go to the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to be judged uh, not according to your sins, but according to your works. Whether it's good works or bad works. And then God will determine your degree of reward at the judgment seat of Christ. 
That's what that judgment is all about. Your sins took place on Calvary when Jesus died for you. He died for your sins. He paid that sin debt. When God saved you, then God pardoned you from all of your past sins. As you serve the Lord Jesus, you're already saved from the penalty of sin. But when you feel that you've done something you shouldn't have done or sinned against God, he said to confess that to God and God will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now when you come to the BMR seat of Christ, there'll be some differences there among believers straightened out. Some say you can be saved and then lost again. Others say you, you can be lost, lost again or be saved and not be lost again. Somebody's wrong. Jesus will state the truth at the judgment seat of Christ. That'll settle the whole business. It'll be an argument. Jesus will settle all differences in doctrine and among believers at the judgment seat of Christ. He states the truth. That settles it. But what you'll face at the BMR seat will be your works. And there are going to be a lot of people standing there with a bowed head in shame because of so little they've done for God. Tomorrow is Labor Day. We need to be concerned about laboring for God. And if you're not laboring for God, you better get busy. One of these days it's going to be too late. Be too late. You need to labor for Him now while you're young. And as you grow up and as you grow older, labor for the Lord. God bless you. You listen well. Let's stand to our feet. Our Father, we brought the message you laid on our heart. We know according to the nation, tomorrow is Labor Day for our laboring people. But our Father, we are concerned today about a laboring Christians, laboring for Thee. Lord, You have a lot to say about Labor Day, a laboring for Thee on the earth. Encourage Thy people here and encourage Thy people in the radio listening audience, Father, to be determined by the grace and help of God they're going to labor for you from here on in as never before. In Christ's name I ask it. Amen. Now Debbie's going to play for us. Now she plays on the instrument. There's somebody in the building here that's unsaved. Uh, you've got out of fellowship with God. Uh, you want to join this church to be your church home. Or uh, for any other reason, God prompts you to come forward. You obey the Lord while she plays a couple of stances. We'll help you. We'll meet you right here and we'll help you. How about it? stanzas now now is your time to come give you ample time to respond if God is speaking you obey obey the Lord 